guys, my name is Rowan Smith and I want to welcome you to the Training for Mountaineering podcast. Now this podcast is entirely dedicated to helping you train, prepare and conquer your upcoming mountaineering adventure. Once a week, I'm going to be sharing with you in-depth and evidence-backed information around improving your physical performance on the mountain, reducing your likelihood of pain and injury, nutrition for mountaineers, and even a bit of mental strength development. So you can be empowered in your training to give yourself the very best chance of a safe, enjoyable, and successful mountaineering adventure. So now that you know what you're in for, let's get into today's episode. Hello, hello guys. Today we are talking all about core training for mountaineers and specifically we're going to be exploring my approach to core training which might seem a little bit different than the popular approach which is very familiar to most mountaineers but it can be incredibly effective and much more time efficient than the traditional approach. Now to start things off, we just want I just want to cover briefly why core strength is important for a mountaineer. Now, we all sort of understand that core strength is important, and time and time again, this has been hammered home in the gym when you're talking to trainers, on the internet, whatever it may be. And you probably heard the phrases, a strong core is important, your core protects your back, make sure you develop the core, and all of this jazz, and almost everyone understands to some degree that they do need to be putting some work and some emphasis here, but for most people the understanding begins to sort of end here and you know they'll say look I know it's important but I'm not 100% sure what it's actually doing to me in my performance in my training in my mountaineer so when we're, when I am talking about the benefits of core training I like to sum it up in three big benefits which are really really easy to understand now number 1 is that a stronger core help improves movement efficiency basically when your core is strong so when your midsection is strong and it's connecting your limbs all very very efficiently there is much less wasted energy through movement now this is um, because the midsection which connects all our limbs um, is simply just more connected to everything. It doesn't have quite as much movement, it's a lot more stable, and when energy is getting transferred between our limbs and between our body and through our body, you're not losing so much energy because there's a a leakage anywhere, which is a really simple way to understand it. For most mountaineers who are on the trail for hours on end, days and even weeks at a time, the less wasted energy is the better. And as you get into steeper climbing, this gets more and more important. Now, this isn't just in your actual expeditions, but also in your training as well. So pretty much anything you're doing in your training, whether it's running, whether it's hiking, whether it's strength training, whether it's climbing training, whatever it may be, if there's wasted energy during that movement, it's just inefficient and it's not what you want. So a stronger core will limit that energy leakage, make that wasted energy a a little less of a concern and just improve your movement efficiency. The second big benefit is um, a strong core improves your stability. So by nature, hiking and climbing is going through an uneven, unpredictable and often unstable environment. So not only is tripping, slipping and sliding annoying and also a big waste of energy, it can also potentially be pretty dangerous. If you're in the middle of nowhere, you have an unlucky slip, you fall, you tumble down and tumble off a cliff or something like that, you know, it might sound a bit far-fetched, but it does happen pretty much every day and so having a stronger core it can improve your stability a little bit more it can help aid your balance it can help keep you stable when things do go wrong so if something does slip out from underneath you if your core reacts and catches you that's very beneficial and if you do actually have a fall whether you fall while you're climbing whether you fall off a cliff whether you just trip over on the trail it can also protect you in that situation as well if everything switches on effectively and resists the external forces it can be pretty effective there so a strong core improves your stability and then thirdly um, a strong core helps protect your back now core strength is pretty important when it comes to protecting your back during both during your training and while on the trail particularly when you are carrying a heavy load or when going through a slip stumble or fall or even during descents now it is definitely not a magic pill here and it's not the type of um the one-stop solution which a lot of people will um, spruik it as and that the fitness industry is really, really renowned about saying get a strong core or fix your back pain. It's not the single most area you need to be thinking about. If you're dealing with lower back pain, we'll probably go into an, um, that a little bit deeper in another episode, but there is no doubt that it is important. 
And considering the amount of lower back pain that mountaineers face on a weekly basis, particularly the office-bound mountaineers who are sort of the weekend warriors, this is an area which definitely shouldn't be neglected. Now, none of these benefits are too complicated. We could probably get a little bit deeper with all of these things and go into a little bit more science and a little bit more specific stuff. But in all honesty, that's good enough. A strong core is going to help your movement efficiency, improve your stability and protect your back. And that sort of gives us an outline of like why we want to be doing this type of thing. Now, when it comes to core training for mountaineers, there's a few particular um, approaches which you just see time, time, time again. And they're very often advocated from, you know, the training articles that go out, the publications that go out and the longtime mountaineers who are following a bit of an old school approach. The way I think about core training is a little bit different than all of this. And here are a few things that I very much believe and I think mountaineers probably do need to wake up to a little bit. Number one is that sit-ups and crunches are an absolute waste of your time. Now, these exercises are so old school, they are not giving you really any benefits or any um, effective benefits for mountaineering. For the small things that it does for you, there's much better ways of going about that. And sit-ups and crunches, while that's the first thing most people think about when it comes to core training, because that's what we're familiar with and it gives us a good burn, it's not a, way, uh, not a good use to your time. And I honestly cannot see any particular reason why a mountaineer should be doing sit-ups or crunches in their preparation. Number two is I don't think you have to spend 20 minutes at a time doing core work. You know, the old school approach of just doing separate core sessions by their own, it's not necessary. It's just not effective. It's not a good use of your time. And in all honesty, if you're just doing endurance work on your core and repetition, repetition, repetitions, it's not it's not an effective way of your training. Sure, it'll get you a strong core and sure, it'll get you good at those particular movements, but there's better ways of going about it. And I honestly don't think you have to spend 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, doing core work on its own. Another one is I don't think core training is an effective warm-up. I see this recommended to mountaineers and I honestly just don't think at all this is appropriate. Sure, some core work in your warm-up can be effective, but using a core session as a warm-up on its own is just ridiculous, in all honesty. It's not going to prepare you for the session moving forward. It's not going to be you know, helping your mobility. It's not going to be getting yourself ready for particular exercises. It's just not an effective warm-up. And when I see mountaineers saying I'm doing 15 minutes of core as a warm-up before lifting or as a warm-up before running, it's just, it's just not a good use of your time. So I don't believe that. And I also very much believe that you need to ensure that there is a solid progression plan with your core training. Now, this is the most common mistake I see with core training, not just for mountaineers, but for anyone else in the fitness world, in the sense that they don't think about how I'm going to progress this exercise, how I'm going to make it more challenging over time, how I'm going to make sure my body keeps on adapting and get a new stimulus. People are pretty good with that with their strength training. When it comes to core training, it's just random training more often than not. And people will be like, look, I'm just going to do a different exercise. I'm going to do this and that instead of just cherry pick whatever they feel like doing on the day. Or they might just do more time on a plank or more reps of a certain exercise. And that's it. You know, there's a much better way of going about that, which we're going to explore in a minute. So my belief around a better way for core training and what I base all my core training around is um, something that's called anti-movement training. Now, traditional core training is all about creating movement. For example, a sit-up, a Russian twist, a reverse crunch, that's all about creating movement through the abdominals to get a good burn on the abs. Sure, you do get a burn and it does feel like it's working quite hard, but it isn't particularly relevant to sporting performance. In the majority of exercise you do, whether it's running, hiking, weight training, climbing, whatever you're doing, your core and your midsection isn't actually creating movement. Rather, what it does is it remains a stable base. It prevents movement through the hips and the spine, keeps them stable, keeps them solid, so the limbs can generate better power. So what's happening is the midsection is pretty much staying in the same place and the limbs are doing all the movement. So in this situation, if that's what's happening during exercise, it makes sense to train the body in a way to teach your core and your midsection to resist this movement during exercise so you can remain stable and generate as much power as you can. And on top of this, resist when external forces are applied to you so your core again can stay, remain stable, remain safe and best help your exercise performance. And that's basically what anti-movement core training is all about, teaching your body to resist movement so it can stay 
stable so it can stay strong and be a really, really solid foundation to help your exercise performance. Now, when we're breaking down anti-movement training, basically you can break it down into three big categories in which you want to be fitting in the majority of your core exercises. This is broken down into anti-extension training, anti-lateral flexion training, and anti-rotation training, which I'm going to break down now. Anti-extension training is all about teaching the body to resist extension through the lumbar spine, which is basically arching through the lower back. The idea here is that the lumbar spine is traditionally more is wants to be a stable joint, meaning it doesn't want a huge amount of movement through it. It wants to stay strong and stable. However, if your anti-extension strength is not strong enough or it fatigues early, among a bunch of other things, and it causes you it causes you to overextend your back, this can lead to a big loss in power production plus extra force going into your lower back, which isn't a great thing. So anti-extension training is all about teaching the lumbar spine to resist extension, to remain strong in that particular plane of motion and not allow any inefficient movement there. Now, the most simple exercise here, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with, is the plank, in which you just hold that position. That's literally what you're doing, trying to fight, no, stop your body arm um, going into that extension, stop your hips dipping, stop that back arching, and that's great. And while planks are great, they are really, really great exercise, and they definitely do what they're doing, and they can be a great addition to a training program. In my opinion, most people just overuse them. Most people are pretty bored with them. Most people hate them, and most people don't have a solid progression plan with them. And they'll just simply do them again and again and again and again. They'll hold them for as long as they can. Occasionally, they'll do a random or challenging variation, but they really don't have any plan around this. And I just think, as a whole, it's just overused. As with any type of training, a little bit of structure goes a long, long way. Instead of, I do use planks in my training, but the first go-to exercise I use for anti-extension training is something that's called the dead bug. Now, if you have done Pilates before, you might be familiar with this exercise. And upon first glance, many mountaineers might scoff at this very humble looking exercise. It looks like it's really low load. It looks like it's really simple. And if you don't do it right, yes, it does feel very easy and it might be a waste of your time. But if you do do it right, and if you do put the head into the right um, areas of that exercise and put your concentration into the exercise, it can be an absolutely phenomenal exercise to develop anti-extension strength to help you in your training and on the mountain. Now, if you don't believe me here, this is an absolute beloved exercise by strength and conditioning coaches all around the world. You know, professional sprinters, professional rugby players, professional baseball players, all of these um, athletes, high-class athletes are doing these exercises and challenge themselves with this exercise. And if you look at it, you think it's too easy, think again and make sure you're doing it right. Now, if you don't know what I'm, I'm talking about and if you've never heard of the dead bug before, um, you can go into YouTube and check it out. There'll be a million videos for you and it's a dead bug, D-E-A-D-B-U-G. You can check that out. Um, number two, the second area you want to be looking at with your anti-movement training is something that's called anti-lateral flexion training. So basically, this type of training, anti-lateral flexion, is literally trying to resist forces of your torso falling over to the side and lateral flexion through the lumbar spine, and lateral flexion just through the torso. The idea behind this is it's just going to resist forces if you sort of step on an uneven trail, if your pack goes the other way, if you run into something, or something like that. You know, there's always a different situation. Um, this is a really, really important sort of plane of motion that you want to be thinking about um, with your core training, and anti-lateral flexion training is an absolute must. Um, the most simple exercise here, which again, I'm pretty sure you most of you are familiar with, is the side plank, in which you're sort of doing a plank position, but up on your side, um, up on one elbow. Very, very effective in this situation. Um, and again, it can really, really be great for here. And you can progress that over time, choose ch more challenging variations. Another great exercise that you might be familiar with is uh, the suitcase carry, in which you're carrying a single dumbbell by your side and walking up and down. And that dumbbell is trying to pull you over to the side. You're resisting that force to keep yourself nice and upright. And that's a really good exercise there as well. And the third type of anti-movement training we want to be looking at is something called anti-rotation training, which is basically resisting forces and resisting the, um, 
teaching the body to resist forces and resisting rotation through the lumbar spine. Now, rotation through the lumbar spine is a really, really bad thing. We don't want it. We want rotation in other areas of the body, but we don't really want it through the lumbar. So we definitely want to be including this in your training. Now, this is a little bit different and a little bit foreign to many, many people because traditionally, when it comes to core training, people will do rotation training. So they'll do movements where they're actually moving through, um, moving, going through a movement and teaching the body to create movement. So that might be, you know, familiar with Russian twists or cable wood chops or something like that, which can be effective, but we want to be thinking about resisting movement in this plane. So uh, the best exercise that I'm aware of in this particular um, situation is something called the Payloff Press, P A L L O F Press. Um, really, really, really effective, really, really fantastic for this particular movement, in which involves you grabbing um, an exercise band or a power band, um, tying to a pole, standing out, standing perpendicular to the pole, and basically pushing the band out. It's a little bit hard to describe over the podcast, but plug that into YouTube, P A L L O F Press. Make sure that's in your preparations. Now, as I said previously, um, with any type of training and particularly with core training, you want to be making sure you have a progression plan in place. Now, traditionally, what most people will do, they'll either add extra repetitions here or they'll just choose um, or extra time or just choose random exercises. You know, extra repetitions and extra time can be great, but you also over time want to be making sure that exercise is more challenging. Now, this doesn't mean you just have to choose a random exercise, um, but you want to go in with a plan from the get-go just to know how you're going to work through and make a particular exercise a little bit more challenging over time. So for example, I'll talk you through a seven stage progression plan, which I do with my dead bugs, which I take all my clients through and which you can sort of extend this out for about 14 weeks or seven times four, 28 weeks, doing a little bit of maths on the podcast. <laughs> Please forgive me, but you can extend this for a long, long time. So the first progression is something called a static dead bug, in which you're just lying on your back, your feet are up at 90 degrees, your arms are straight, you drop your legs down, and you just find challenging position, and you hold that for a certain amount of time. That's literally all you do, and that's the first progression. Do that for three to four weeks. Next progression is a standard dead bug, in which you're lying on your back, Foot knees, um, legs up to 90 degrees, arms out straight. You drop opposite arm, opposite leg to the floor, bring the back up to center, opposite arm, opposite leg to the floor, bring it up to the center. And that's the next progression. After about three or four weeks of that, you'll go through into a wall push dead bug in which you're in the same position, except instead of your arms being straight above your head, um, straight um, straight up to the sky, I should say, you're pushing them straight above your head right into a wall. So you're getting tension through your shoulders. That adds a little bit extra challenge. And then you just drop one leg down the floor and alternate between that. And you do that for four weeks. The next one is you're going to do a banded dead bug in which you get a band, a, a power band, you tie it to a pole. And then basically you basically you pull that overhead and have that uh, have your arms pointing straight above above you holding that band and what's going to happen is that band is going to try and pull your arms overhead you're going to resist that force that's going to put a little extra challenge into the exercise and then you do the same thing one leg down one leg up next one's with a dumbbell dead bug instead of you holding a band you just hold one heavy dumbbell and two hands straight up to the sky you do the same thing for four weeks next one's this um, a dumbbell dead bug with one hand in which you hold one dumbbell in one hand and you do opposite arm opposite leg and then swap over one hand opposite arm opposite leg and then the final one is something that's called a banded anti-rotation dead bug in which you're holding a band, but instead of it being um, pulling, trying to pull your arms backwards, you're perpendicular to the band, so it's trying to pull your arms to the side, and that gets a little bit of anti-rotation training in there. Now, obviously, you're getting your head around those exercises a little bit tricky over the audio format, but you can plug any of those exercises into YouTube that will pop up. Just to go through that progression again, a static dead bug, normal dead bug, wall push dead bug, banded dead bug, dumbbell dead bug with two hands, dumbbell dead bug with one hand, banded anti-rotation dead bug. So you might do each exercise, each variation for three weeks at a time. Over those three weeks, each week you just do a little bit extra, um, a few more repetitions or a little bit extra time. And that's an amazing progression plan, which you can go over the long term. Really, really effective. And you sort of do the same thing with all your other exercises. You sit down, you say, how do I want to progress my payload press? How do I want to progress my um, side plank and that's probably a really really good use of your time if you're very much into your training 
So once you figure out your exercises, you want to sort of have a think about where you're actually going to fit in your core training. Because as I said before, not great as a whole warm up and not great to be doing um, full core sessions. What I highly recommend in this situation is to fit your core training into your rest periods in your strength training. So traditionally, when you're doing your strength training, you do one exercise, you'll have a rest, you do the same exercise, have a rest, have, do the same exercise, have a rest. That can work, but you're just wasting time, really. Um, fit core training in any of your strength training rest periods. It's so effective. It's still going to help your legs or your upper body recover, but it's going to be a good use of that time. So you might do a set of squats and then might do a set of um, payload press and then squats then payload press and go around like that. Um, really, really great place to put it and I highly, highly recommend that. As well as in your warm-up, towards the end of your warm-up, you might choose one core exercise to do, not 10 or 20, but one single core exercise to do just to sort of wake up the core, just make sure those muscles are working, make sure you've got your head in the game and you're switching everything on. So you might do a dead bug or a plank or a side plank or something in your warm up just to help that. Those are probably the two places I highly recommend you put them in. Anywhere else you can, but I don't think it's a good use of your time. So plop them in there. Now, you might be thinking that that doesn't really sound like enough. Maybe you're used to doing 20-minute core sessions and you're like, hey, oh, hang on, if I'm only doing a few exercises in the gym, that might only work out in like four exercises a week in core training, which, yeah, that is not much. But if you challenge yourself properly with these exercises and don't just faff around with it and don't just take it really easy, this will be plenty. Make sure it is a challenge. Make sure you're focused with these exercises. Make sure you go through it properly and they will be enough. Now, on top of all of this, anytime you're doing heavy strength training, it's going to be doing phenomenal things for your core anyway, as will loaded pack intervals, as will your climbing. So it's not like this is the only stimulus your core is getting to get stronger, but all of your strength training, all of your climbing, all of your loaded pack walking will be helping these particular muscles get stronger. Now, some people are very big advocates and they'll simply do heavy strength training, so heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, and say that's all the core work they need to do because that's how powerful a stimulus it can be. Personally, I don't think that's enough. You do need a little bit extra, but you certainly don't need to be doing huge, huge, huge amounts of core training if you're doing those other things. So room for thought there. Now, to finish things off, there are a few final tips that I want to go through. Um, now, core strength is just one facet of accessory training. So what I mean by this is in those rest periods in your strength training, generally you're putting an accessory movement in there. And core strength is one facet of that. So if you were trying to develop your core in those particular movements, yes, you can do that. But if you don't just have to focus on your midsection here, and quite often um, quite often people just get very, very obsessed with their midsection, but there's a lot more that can go into this type of training when there's low load stuff, which you might fit into your warm ups or might fit into your rest periods. A few other areas which might have a priority depending on what you need. It might be hip flexor strength in which you might do in, be doing you know, mini band um, marches to help your hip, hip flexors. You might be doing need a bit of an extra knee stability. So you might be doing banded terminal knee extensions or something like that. You might need more glute strength. So you might be doing mini band walks. You might be doing need more ankle stability so you might be doing you know round the world standing on a on a mat or standing on a pillow or something like that or you might need shoulder stability so you might be doing wits or scapular attractions or something like that so if you are thinking of hey i've got all these rest periods in my strength training do i need to do only core there no you can fit in a vast range of different exercises so don't get caught in that trap and i just wanted to mention that because i know people do go down that route of thinking look i just need more and more core but actually we've got all these other little areas that we might be considering working on so to wrap things up just because you have always done something the same way doesn't mean it's the best way. I honestly think there's a much better way of going about your core training, which I have explained today. And I think that's a much better use of your time as a mountaineer than doing the traditional approach. Be smart with your core training, challenge yourself in your exercises, be efficient with your time and make sure you have a progression plan and work on that anti-movement training. And I think that's going to be much, much, much more effective for your time on the mountain as opposed to the traditional approach. Approach. So, got into a little bit of detail today, guys. If anything wasn't too, um, wasn't so clearly explained, please do let me know. Feel free to shoot me an email anytime or swing me a message over my social media if you do want examples of any of those exercises or want to learn a little bit more about that. Um, 
As always, if you have enjoyed this podcast, I would absolutely love if you could leave a review, leave a rating, and even share it with another aspiring mountaineer, potentially um, someone who might love their big course sessions and might want a bit of a different approach. I would really appreciate your help trying to grow this podcast, reach more mountaineers, and make a bigger impact on the mountain community. So thank you so much for listening today, guys. I really, really appreciate you tuning in, and we'll talk to you very soon. Bye.